A Viking vessel sailed by the guidance of the sun and the stars, and steered directly westwards. For the first two days and nights, a steady east wind filled the square sail and carried them steadily forwards. There were high spirits and much excited expectation on board. Indeed, it seemed as though the wind had been sent by Odin with the sole purpose of furthering their journey, but just as they had settled down in confidence that they were under God's special protection, the weather began to shift and change. The wind now took the wrong direction and seemed uninterruptedly occupied in settling private accounts with the towering waves of the sea. In the course of two days and nights, it had gone several times round the horizon and varied through all degrees of strength, from a moderate calm to what Vikings would mildly call a storm. And then, all of a sudden it disappeared. They looked longingly for it, in all directions. For though they had cursed its vagaries hardly enough, it was still preferable to a dead calm. But it was absent, and remained absent. Unreliable as it always had been, it had gone off to other regions and left them alone here in the midst of the sea. There lay the vessel, pitching lazily and making no way at all. Where they were, no one knew and there was nothing to show them. Whether the wind had carried them while it was still with them and blew alternately from all points of the compass, they could not find out. The sun and stars had only rarely been visible, the spirits of all on board were rapidly sinking, when after several days and nights of calm, there came gliding, a cunning silent bank of fog and swallowed them up, blotted them out from the eyes of heaven, swept all side of sea and sky out of the world, and left the vessel lying, rocking lonely forgotten by all good powers on a strange sea. Leif had given all hope now, morose and aggrieved, he surrendered himself to the power of change. He sat most of the days on the gunwheel with his legs dangling outside, singing from sheer despair. Only now and then he interrupted his song, to hurl a violent succession of sanguinary curses in a penetrating angry voice, into the damp foggy air. With every day that passed, his brother Ingolf became more silent and introspective. He didn't like being questioned regarding the number of the days he had marked off. The days were quite bad enough without making them more by talking about them, and at last, he flatly refused to answer questions regarding the number of the days. For long periods he would sit silent looking at his stick, forgetting to mark the days, with his mind full of inward longing and powerful exorcisms. He heard that the crew were talking about drawing lots for a sacrifice although he was not narrow-minded, but he remembered the offerings which before his journey he had made to Odin, as well as the foes he had made of further offerings if the journey prospered. Odin had often fulfilled his wishes for less sacrifices than those. He really did not understand what was the matter with Odin this time. Halvig and Helga were the only ones on board who to some extent kept up their spirits. To Halvig it seemed quite natural, they were very well off, and the fog and the calm must sometime come to an end. Every morning she awoke with the firm conviction that that day the fog would lift. Helga, on the other hand, had to pull herself together in order not to be infected by the depression of the rest, and on this occasion she had, besides, Halvig's good humor to support her. But their good temper seemed almost to put the crew into a still worse humor. Even Ingolf, not to speak of Leif, could sometimes be impatient at their own concern. And one day, in answer to a cheerful remark of Halvig's, he very curtly drew her attention to the fact that the water casks were seriously near becoming empty. Halvig looked at him steadily and a little astonished. Ingolf had never before seen that look in her eyes and she went to her hut without saying anything more. Ingolf looked round for Helga. She stood by the gunwheel, playing with Leif's hair. When Ingolf had thus ascertained that Helvig was alone in the hut, he followed her into it.
Halvig was sitting and looking before her when he came. She did not meet his glance as usual, but remained sitting and staring into space with a troubled expression on her serious face. Ingolf stopped before her and laid his hand on her shoulder. Then Halvig looked up at him. It can do no good to give up, she said seriously. That will not make things better. Have you not noticed how the men follow you with their eyes and are disturbed by your looks? The fog may lift some time, and since it had not rained for a long time, it may soon rain, so that we can again have the water casks filled, and we have also beer and wine on board, so we can get along for quite some time. What makes me uneasy, answered Ingolf, is that we seem to be pursued by misfortune, and that I don't know at all where we are. If the fog and the calm continue and there is no rain for some time, it will soon be all over with us. It was never a good idea that we took Helga and you with us on this journey. I have also heard that the crew are beginning to talk among themselves of casting lots. Perhaps a sacrifice will be necessary. Halvig was silent for a long time. At last she sighed deeply and said, I have never been able properly to understand how our gods can desire human sacrifices. Perhaps, however, I would have agreed on this occasion if I was quite sure that the lot would not fall on you. Let us rather wait a while, Ingolf. Ingolf left her with a firm resolve henceforth to alter his outward demeanor. He saw that the first and foremost thing was his duty and obligation to exhibit to the crew a calm and untroubled face. Be the outlook never so hopeless. The first man he met he greeted with a cheerful remark, and after that day, he was altogether more lively and communicative. When the crew saw what an alternation had taken place in Ingolf, their desire for a sacrifice and drone of Lot ceased. Ingolf's altered demeanor inspired them with hope and courage. Towards morning they began at last to talk together in a whisper. Ingolf opened his whole mind to Halvig and confided to her his most secret thoughts and anxieties. Halvig said, that she had married him because she intended to share his fortunes whether they were good or bad, for she feared neither life nor death, if only she had him. While they were still lying there and whispering together, Leif stood suddenly in the doorway and shouted. He had kept watch during the night and had good news to tell. The fog was gone and the wind was gradually rising. He had given orders to hoist the sail and now only wished to ask whither they should sail, for he did not know. The sky was overclouded all the time, and the sun could not be seen. Would Ingolf come to see if he perhaps could send out the right direction? Ingolf was on his legs in an instant. All anxiety and trouble was blown away from his soul by the first puff of wind. He took counsel with his deepest instincts, and found a direction to sail in. The wind was rather slack at first, but then it had got out of the habit of blowing. In the course of the day, it freshened to splendid sailing weather. There were birds on the water, so they must be near some land. Towards evening they caught a glimpse of a dark streak ahead, which showed distinctly against the fog banks on the horizon. There rose a shout on board. Land inside! Then Helga wept. No one was astonished at it. Some of the men also felt a flutter at their hearts this time, on sighting land again. But Halvik stood quiet and undisturbed, staring at the dark streak ahead, asking herself what sort of land it was. Were they already there? That night, no one thought of seeking sleep or rest. Early in the morning, they were among some precipitous green islands which were divided by narrow straits with strong currents. From the vessel they could hear and their catch sight of smoke from houses and huts. This then was an inhabited land and not the one they sought. One of the old men on board has been here before and was able to inform them that these were the Faroe Isles. That reassured Ingolf and it meant they had not come out of their course. There was great joy on board. Here they could go on shore, feel firm ground under their feet and provide themselves with water. There were some among the crew who ventured to hint that the voyage has lasted long enough, but a look from Ingolf was enough to reduce them to silence. All depression and doubt had been swept out of his mind along with the fog.
The brothers now had all tubs, buckets, together with the empty barrels and casks which were on board, filled with water from a spring on the coast. When that had been seen too, they were so fortunate as to get good weather with a stiff breeze. It was again possible to sail by the sun and stars, straight to the west. They left the Faroe Isles astern and made for the open sea. The weather remained fine with a light breeze blowing. The wind was certainly somewhat capricious, both as regards force and direction, but it blew all the time, and that was what was needed. Only seldom could the vessel hold on a straight course, they were obliged to tack, and so the way became somewhat uncertain. Still, they made progress. On the seventh day after leaving the Pharaohs, they at last sighted land, a large and wide stretching land, crowned by white glaciers behind blue mountains, and land with broad open fjords and bright streams, which wound down green mountain sides, rose from the sea before their wandering eyes. This must be the land they sought, here then it lay, solitary and uninhabited, far away in the uttermost part of the sea. It lay silent and patient expecting them. The land greeted them with sunshine and summer and blue mountains. Majestic it lay there, with skyward towering promontories and broad mouths of fjords, which like open arms, offered them a royal welcome. No other land had ever received them with such a vestal and solemn greeting as this land gave them. A strange silence spread on board the vessel. It was early in the morning that they sailed into a fjord full of swans. The blue surface of the fjord was completely covered with these white birds, which with proudly lifted necks and in great flogs, swam to one side as the ship glided on. Many other birds swam among them, variegated either ducks and handsome waterfowl. But one did not notice them because of the white swans. Halvig named the fjord Svanafjord. The brothers had chosen this fjord because it was protected by a little group of islands, which might make it more secure as a winter haven than the open fjords. They tacked a little to and fro, using a corner of their sail, and surveyed the land. Bare mountains rose on either hand. On the north was a strip of fertile land along the fjord. On the east side the waves broke freely at the base of the mountain. The land of the end of the fjord seemed fertile and inviting, but they could not find a landing place which suited them. Ingolf proposed that they should inspect a little more closely the nearest fjord south of the one they were in. He had seen from the ship that there lay a broad fjord sheltered by a small low group of islands. They tacked past the promontory and entered the other fjord. It was both broader and deeper than the one they had just come from, but was likewise full of swans. Halvik laughed with gladness when she saw it. This fjord also must be called Svanefjord, she declared. They might be called north and south. She did not know there were so many swans to be found in the world. Birds love this land, she said to herself. Helga stood by her side. She compelled herself to smile and share Halvig's gladness. But her heart was full of pain, for the beautiful land she saw and already seemed to love could never be hers. She saw the swans, the mountains and the green dales. But in her heart there was no room for anything but a quiet, slightly strange emotion. The scent of the pines from the islands at home was too keen in her memory. Ingolf and Leif stood silent in a solemn mood side by side. They looked at the land and did not say a word. They had stood thus a long time when Ingolf turned to his brother and said quietly, What do you think of the land, Leif? It is a big land and seems a good one, answered Leif in a low voice. If only most of it was not barren mountain, said Ingolf, but his voice lacked the reservation which his words expressed. I think we might soon feel at home among these mountains, said Leif. It does not look unfriendly, Ingolf admitted. 
In his inmost heart he was deeply moved. The strength and sternness of the mountains filled his mind with a peculiar excitement. Among these mountains, the green dills and virile stretches of land, which he caught a glimpse of at the end of the fjord, assumed a doubly homelike aspect. Suddenly Leif awoke from his long reflection and silent contemplation. Abruptly and unexpectedly as always, a resolve had been born in his mind and aroused him. It is all the same to me what sort of land it is. I shall settle here, he declared in an excited tone. Since I have come, I think it would disappoint the land if I left it again, and I will not disappoint this land, which lies here so ready to receive me. So much is certain. Ingolf was silent. Leif had given expression to his own thoughts. He felt so convinced at this moment that here it was his lot to settle and remain. But this feeling was followed in his mind by a peculiar anxiety which almost made him sorry. Was it a good land? A land where one could peacefully build and settle, and where his family could flourish in happiness and prosperity? Not himself alone, but his children and children's children should dwell here if he determined to settle himself in the place. The brothers chose a landing place on the north side of the fjord and steered thither. It was with strange feelings that they set foot on this new land, which from time immemorial had lain here behind the sea and the distance alone with its birds. On sea and land everywhere the birds swarm. The questioning whistle of the golden plover and the rippling quaver of the curlew were the first sounds that greeted them as they trod the stones of the shore. Ingolf and Leif immediately set the crew to work to bring the animals on land and to unload the vessel. They themselves proceeded to pitch their tents after having selected a spot with thick green grass well protected from wind and weather by a projection of rock and close to the brink of a small clear stream. The kitchen utensils were brought up and the fire kindled. The shore was covered with driftwood so that there was plenty of fuel. Pots containing salted flesh were hung up and at last they got hot meat again. They could not remember that any meat had tasted so good as this hot and salty flesh. After the dried fish preserves flesh and hard and finely moldy bread they had on the sea voyage, they baked bread too and ate it warm from the embers. It was splendid to have soft bread between their teeth again. Around them the animals dispersed grazing eagerly over the virile pastures. It was a pleasure to see the satisfaction with which they swallowed the green grass. Towards evening the vessel was so far unloaded that it could be brought ashore and rolled on logs over the ground. They had chosen a little cleft in the rocks for it to lie in shelter during the winter. By the evening, when the men had crept into their skin bags and had lain down to sleep, Ingolf and Leif Halvig and Helga still sat round the remains of the fire, but did not think of sleep. They sat silent close to one another and did not talk. The night was bright and still, and dew was falling. The fire gleamed palely in the night. Red amber snakes wreathed at the bottom of it. The fjord spread a shining surface, dotted white with sleeping swans. There was a peace and stillness over the land, which filled their minds with a sense of expectation. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about our latest videos.